What's up guys, it's Brad from Lad Architect here. In this video, I'm going to be showing you how you can add 3D buildings and other objects to your live action footage using motion tracking inside of Blender. I'll be going through a simple motion tracking process and showing some tips on how you can light and create the environment inside of the computer to match your live action shot a little bit more effectively. For this specific video, I'll be using some 3D buildings from our updated City Builder 3D asset-based add-on released on Blender Market. But of course, you can use any buildings or 3D models of your choice in the same process. Anyways guys, let's get started. Here we are inside of Blender. The first thing we're going to do is of course just delete everything in our scene here so we can get a clean start. So I'll go ahead and just select everything and delete it. And the first thing we want to do is import the live action footage inside of Blender so that we can motion track it. So I'll go ahead and go to this plus tab here and then I'll go to visual effects and then we'll go to motion tracking here and select it. And uh, now our motion tracking interface will come up here and what we want to do first is just open up our video footage. So I'll go ahead and press open and now I'm just going to navigate to uh, some footage I've downloaded from pixabay.com. It's just a nice little drone shot that would be cool to uh, add our building to, as you can see here. And before we go through our motion tracking process, I think it's nice to set the uh, Blender scene to have the same frames as your live action footage so that we can load our whole clip and render out the uh, 3D environment to last the same amount of time as our movie clip. So I'll go ahead and select set scene frames here. And then I'll go ahead and also select the uh, prefetch option here, which is just going to go ahead and go through this video clip here and preload all of our frames to make the process a little bit faster for us. And we'll just wait for it to finish here. And uh, now, as you can see here, we can scroll through the uh, timeline pretty nicely here. And it's a pretty cool shot here uh, from a drone. Again, I got this from Pixabay. You can download it and uh, use it for free. I'll go ahead and put the link to this specific clip in the description if you want to follow along with the exact clip. But of course, this process will also work for other live action footage that you might want to use. All right, so let's go ahead and track this footage inside of Blender. And if you don't know what 3D tracking is, essentially 3D tracking is the process of telling the 3D camera in inside of the computer, how your live action camera was moving so that we can overlay 3D objects onto our scene and have it move around like it were actually there. Then we can use all this tracking data to add uh, different elements to the scene inside of a 3D environment that matches up to the scene as the camera is moving. So uh, that's what 3D tracking is. And to do that, what we want the computer to do is track a bunch of objects in both the foreground and the background of the scene here so that it knows kind of the uh, parallax and the movement of the camera so it's important whenever you're tracking something to choose kind of points in the foreground as well as points in the background. And whenever you're choosing tracking points specifically, you want to choose points of contrast. So there are several different ways to do this. The most tedious and if it's a really complex shot, the way you might have to do it is by uh, just kind of scrolling in here. You want to choose the pattern size, which is kind of uh, how big of an area you want to track. And then you want to choose the search size, which is the amount of pixels Blender is going to search for um, into the next frame of that tracking point. But essentially what we want to do here is we want to uh, maybe increase the pattern size to 30 and the uh, search size a little bit as well. And uh, if your camera is moving really fast, you want to increase these a lot more. But as you can see here, when we scroll through our footage, it's a uh, pretty subtle camera move. So we shouldn't have any issues tracking 30 pixels with a search size of 80 as we go from frame to frame. So uh, what we can do here is to add tracking points individually. We can just find points of contrast. For example, this nice car here, we can go ahead and press command and click. And now we just added a tracking point on this car here. And what we can do is if we want to just track through the whole scene with just this one tracking point, what we can do is we can go to the track tab here and just click on uh, our track markers button and we can just play through it. And as you can see, Blender is going to go through the entire scene and track that point of contrast. And uh, since we started halfway through the clip, we also want to track backwards with the same point. Now, as you can see throughout our whole clip, we have tracked the uh, front of the car here, which gives some good tracking data for Blender to calculate how the camera is moving for the live action shot so that it can recreate it inside the computer. And Blender needs a total of at least eight points throughout your clip to track the scene effectively. So as you can see here, we've just added one, but if we wanted to continue this process, we could just select eight more uh, points of contrast throughout our scene here, making sure to choose some in the foreground here, as well as some in the background, and uh, then let Blender track through all those points and then we could just go to the solve panel here and go through the rest of our process that I'll show here in a minute. If you don't want to add points manually and you want to just have Blender detect the features of your scene so that you can uh, kind of move a little bit quicker in your scene if the uh, shot is something simple like this, what you can do is you can actually uh, we'll go ahead and start from scratch here. What you can do is you can actually just go to the beginning of your scene here 
go to frame zero and we can just go ahead and select the detect features button and now Blender is going to just kind of uh, select some points of contrast in your scene for you so that you can now just go ahead and track all of these points at once. So now that we've used the detect features option, we can just go ahead and again, go through our scene with our tracking button here and Blender will go through and track all these points for us. And as you can see, since the camera move here is uh, fairly controlled, Blender is tracking these points pretty effectively, but if the camera move was going pretty crazy, sometimes you have to more carefully choose the uh, uh, points of contrast to track inside of your scene but uh, this is looking pretty good as you can see here we have some pretty good data to work with I'm going to go ahead and go to the end of our scene here and also go ahead and select detect features again and then I'm just going to go backwards so that we have a few more uh, points to work with. And again, you only need eight points, but sometimes having more data to work with is helpful when you go through uh, cleaning your track and uh, getting a little bit more accurate results. So it's nice to just have a little bit more uh, inputs for Blender to work off of. And uh, as you can see on the bottom here, you can see the data on the graph here. And one thing I'm always looking out for when I'm looking at this graph after I've tracked something is points that are going crazy off of the main line here. So as you can see, we have some of these points down here that are going way off the uh, majority of our points here in the uh, center of our graph so that's just kind of a red flag that suggests that some of the points are slipping and aren't very accurate so what we're going to do once blender goes through all these tracking points and finishes up here it's at 96 percent right now is we're going to clean the data so that we don't have uh, any skewed points here all right so blender has tracked all of our different markers here now what we can do first is we can just scroll through it here and see if we can notice any slipping tracks so as you can see here this one here in the center of our scene is uh, slipping off of its uh, point for a few frames so we can go ahead and select that individually and I'll go ahead and press X to delete it and uh, we can just kind of keep scrolling through it here and we want to just make sure that all of our tracking points are staying on their points of contrast in our scene. All right, so now that Blender has some tracking data to work with, what we're going to do is we're just going to go to the uh, Solve tab here. We'll just go ahead and select a few keyframes here where the parallax is more pronounced. But as you can see, our scene has pretty constant movement, so we probably don't really need to change that much. However, I will just change it from 10 to frame 40, just so it's a little bit further in the clip there. And we can also click on the Refine characteristics button here and go to uh, focal length k1 k2 and uh, if you don't have the camera data or if for example in this case I've just pulled this clip from online I don't have the camera sensor data or the lens data what you can do is you can use the refine uh, tool here so blender can kind of guess the uh, focal length for you um, but if you do have the camera data and you shot the image yourself what you can do is you can go to the tracking settings here and then you can add your camera data as well as the focal length of the lens that you shot with as well as all of the uh, lens distortion data and all of that um, but again for this specific case we're going to kind of let blender figure that out for us and actually instead of uh, selecting our own keyframes here I'll go ahead and select the keyframe option here which is just going to uh, as you can see allow uh, blender to automatically select the keyframe when solving the camera object motion so just kind of a preset there that I found works pretty well and now we'll just go ahead and make sure all of our tracking points are selected and we'll just go ahead and press solve camera motion and uh, now Blender is going to go through our tracking data and solve our camera. And as you can see here, we have a solve error of 1.2 pixels, which is super good. We can actually use this pretty well. In my mind, based on my experience, anything under two is pretty good, but I try to get it under one. So let's go ahead and clean the data so that we can get a little bit better solve error here. So what we can do here, as well as kind of scrolling through and finding the points that are uh, slipping off of their points of contrast in our scene here and just deleting those, what we can do to get Blender to help us is we can just use our cleanup tab here so let's go ahead and uh, first kind of click on the uh, side of our scene here so that everything is deselected and then we'll just go ahead and under the cleanup tab we'll just click on uh, reprojection error and change it to one and then press enter and then we'll go ahead and press uh, clean tracks and now blender is going to select all of those uh, tracking points in your scene with an error of one or more and it's going to select them and now we can go ahead and delete those pressing X and delete track and uh, now we can go ahead and select everything again and press solve camera motion and see if we get a better result all right so that actually made our solve error worse let's go ahead and uh, see what's going on here I might just scroll through here and see if there's uh, any tracking data that I can manually delete I'm seeing uh, one back here that's slipping a little bit let's see what that one's doing here 
yeah you can see that one slipping quite a bit I'll go ahead and delete it and uh, let's go ahead and scroll through and see if anything else is slipping this one looks like it might have slipped a little bit as well yep that one's slipping a bit go ahead and delete that one the rest of these up top look pretty good and I don't see any noticeable slipping right now and another thing we can do is we can uh, go ahead and select some of these points that are way off our graph and see if they're slipping. So as you can see here, this is uh, a point that's way off of our graph here compared to everything else. And this one's slipping as well. We'll go ahead and select that, delete that. And here's another one over here. Let's go ahead and select that wherever it is. There it is. See, it slips right there. So let's go ahead and uh, just delete that one as well. And now that I'm looking at the rest of the tracking data, it's looking much cleaner here. I don't know what these are. Let's go ahead and uh, try to solve this one more time. Go ahead and press solve camera motion. And we're still getting a pretty high solve error here. Oh, I see a few uh, that are a little bit off here. This one right here. There's one slipping there as well. Go ahead and delete that one. All right, so let's go ahead and select everything one more time. And this time I might just deselect the uh, keyframe selection here just to uh, see if we could just manually select our keyframes and uh, try this one more time. And as you can see here, now we have a solve error of 0.34 pixels, which is uh, you know less than a pixel, so super good. And now we can go ahead and add our camera and our 3D camera inside of the scene should move the same way as our live action shot has been filmed here. So before we get into uh, adding our building and all that stuff into our scene here, we need to do a few more things in the tracking process. Let's go ahead and first we'll go ahead and click on set as background. And uh, what that's gonna do is it's going to make our movie clip here automatically be in the background of our scene inside of blender once we add a camera to it and then we'll also go ahead and go ahead and choose a point for the origin of our scene so since i uh, i want to add a little building to uh, this kind of ridge here so i'll go ahead and make this the origin of our scene here so i'll go ahead and select set origin and uh, actually first we need to add a camera to our scene here And now as you can see here, that origin data has been applied to our camera. So it's kind of uh, pointing as if this uh, point here in the center of our 3D world is the, uh, is the origin point of uh, this tracking point right here. So if we go to view camera, you can see uh, the origin point right here. So that's looking pretty good. Now let's go ahead and uh, click three points in our scene that we want to set up as the floor of our scene. And then we'll go ahead and select three points on our ridge here and we'll go ahead and make that the floor of our scene and now blender has used these three points to create the floor of our 3d camera here and now what we can do finally is we can go ahead and click on setup tracking scene and now automatically we have a nice ground plane where we'll have our shadow catcher as well as a cube which will be kind of your base uh, foreground object to start with to uh, kind of add to your scene from there so now that we've done this let's go ahead and go to layout mode here and we'll go to view viewpoint camera and now as you can see here when we scroll through our camera we have a nice uh, 3D track and everything in our 3D world is acting as if it's in the live action shot. And by clicking that setup tracking scene button, automatically we have a foreground collection here with uh, this cube on it, which will be rendered right now as our uh, main object in the live action shot. But of course we're going to add a building there instead, but we just have a default cube there. And then in our background collection here is just our ground, which will act as our shadow catcher. And then in the compositing tab as well, Blender has automatically set up these two collections to uh, act as both your uh, foreground layer and your background shadow catcher so that you can uh, kind of have a general compositing setup to start from for your compositing process. All right, so now that we've tracked our scene, let's get to the fun part and add the 3D building and create the environment to light the 3D building to match it to our live action shot. So let's go ahead and first I'll go ahead and go ahead and select our camera here. And I'm just going to go ahead and select the motion tracking button here so we can see our motion tracking data as we scroll through the scenes because it's a little bit nicer to reconstruct your environment as you can see that motion tracking data and as you can see here all of these uh, points that were once tracking points in uh, the motion tracking tab here that we added are now points inside of your 3d world which are recreating that geometry inside of the 3d world but anyways let's get to adding our 3d building so I'll go ahead and go to viewpoint camera 
And now I'll go ahead and select our cube here and go ahead and delete that. And uh, I just wanna add one of the City Builder 3D assets here. So we'll go ahead and use one of the new Soviet assets. So we'll go ahead and click uh, the center of our scene here where we want to add it and then just click on Soviet small five. And now we have a fully textured 3D asset inside of our scene here ready to go. And now we can create that environment to light this as if it were in the live action shot. So first we'll go ahead and position this kind of near the center of the ridge here. Maybe scale it down a little bit so it's a little bit more realistic here. Also scale down the ground plane a little bit. All right, that's pretty good. And now what we want to do is we want to uh, first go ahead and switch to Cycles Rendering Engine. So we'll go ahead and select the uh, render properties, switch the render engine to Cycles since uh, that's going to give us a little bit more realistic lighting. And now that we've kind of generally placed our building here, we want to recreate the lighting and the environment around our building here so that when we render it, it will match the live action footage a lot better. And then we can add all the other compositing layers to blend that in even more in our post-production process. But let's go ahead and select our ground plane here and our ground plane by default is going to just be a shadow catcher but we also want the uh, color of this ground plane to be similar to the color of the ground in our live action shot so that our building has relatively realistic environment reflections on it and it isn't just bouncing up a white uh, ground onto our building because that looks a little bit uncanny so what we can do here is while it's selected is we can just go to the material tab add a new material and then we'll just go to diffuse material here and we'll just go to the color tab and then just use the eyedropper here to select maybe just a kind of a darker shade of our tan color here of our live action shot and now we have this ground plane kind of reflecting the general color of the ground in our live action shot and uh, of course you can also reproject this exact background onto this ground plane as well if you want it to be even more accurate but in this specific shot I'm just going to go with a general color because I think that'll look good enough for this final shot all right so now that we've created the ground for our scene let's Let's go ahead and go to the uh, world properties here. And one thing that we could do to recreate the world around our 3D asset here is we could uh, kind of use an HDRI of a similar environment and just kind of import this into the world settings and kind of create some realistic reflections on our 3D building here. But a lot of the times you don't have a 3D HDRI of the same environment that you shot in. So what you can do instead is you can use the uh, basic sky inside of Blender to kind of create that ambience from the ground up. So so what we can do here is under the world settings here, we'll go to color and we'll go to sky texture. And uh, in Blender 2.9, the default uh, sky model is the Nishita sky model. And it's super cool actually. Before I've used the Hozek Wilkie, which is also really nice. But Nishita, as you can see here, you have a lot of different settings that you can play around with. You can play around with the density of the air molecules, the density of the dust, the uh, ozone layer, and then of course the strength, and then the sun intensity, sun size, sun elevation, sun rotation and then the altitude as well so it's super cool I'll go ahead and go to rendered view here and you can actually see our sky environment lighting up our scene and the reason our 3d building is so dark like this is because it's on our background layer which is our shadow catcher so I'll go ahead and move this to our foreground area and uh, now we are seeing our fully textured 3d asset ready to go here so we'll go back to camera view here and now what we want to do is we want to kind of adjust our sky settings to match the sky of our live action shot so I'll go ahead and turn off our background for now and as you can see in our live action video here the Sun is coming off from the right side here at a pretty low angle and if we zoom in we can actually see that the car has a pretty hard shadow just directly off to the side here so we want to try to match the Sun's direction to that and it's also pretty close to sunset so we want the uh, sun elevation to be probably pretty low so probably 15 degrees is pretty good but we want to change the rotation a little bit because right now the sun is coming from the opposite direction in our sky setting so we can just change this maybe to something like 180 and now as you can see here the sun is lighting our 3d element from the other side which is giving it a lot more realistic result here and again when we render that shadow as well it's going to be even more realistic and uh, again as I mentioned you can also change the altitude of these uh, sky models as well so I think it's pretty cool when you go a little bit higher it gets a little more blue and uh, I uh, think it might match our scene a little bit better so maybe something like uh, two so kind of experiment around with these settings to match your 3d sky model to the uh, sky in your live action shot so go ahead and increase the altitude a little bit and see what that does for us. That's looking pretty good around uh, four, kind of blending into our environment pretty nicely. And it's also giving our building a nice little side light, which is uh, matching our 3D environment as well. And I might just adjust the rotation a little bit more here. 
try to match it a little bit better. I might also just decrease the strength of our uh, sky a little bit, maybe to something like 0.8. That's looking uh, a little bit better. And now that we've created our environment and adjusted it to the live action shot, what I wanna do is I want to go to the uh, render properties here, and then under film, I just wanna make the background transparent. So now we can see our 3D environment directly on top of our live action shot, and we don't have to uh, see the sky when we don't want to. So at this point, our sky environment is still lighting our scene, but we can just uh, see what it's doing to our 3d world instead of dealing with it all the time and we can see it with a little bit more clarity here so go ahead and, and enable that transparent option now let's go ahead I'll go ahead and re-enable our background layer and I'll go ahead and reselect our ground and one thing we want to do is we want to make sure that the shadow catcher of our ground plane is working effectively so what we what we want to do is we want to uh, go ahead and add a Sun to our scene and we'll just put it off to the side here and just sidelight our building real quick. And of course, our sky environment is also including a sun in that output, especially with the new Nishida sky model. However, it's nice to also have a little bit more control of your uh, shadows with a uh, actual sun lamp inside of Blender. So let's go ahead and try this one first and see what we can do. I'll go ahead and reselect the ground plane here. Make sure that the sun is just in the general scene collection here and uh, select your ground plane. And we want to go ahead and disable some of these restriction toggles. And now as you can see under the background layer, we can uh, disable this holdout and we can see our shadow a little bit better. All right, so we have a uh, nice little shadow on our ground plane here. And what's creating the shadow right now is not actually the sun that we've added here. As you can see, if we just delete it, what's actually creating the shadow is in our world settings. Again, we've added our Nishida sky model, which includes a sun disk. And that sun disk is going to create that hard shadow that you see here. As you can see, if we deselect it, that sun disk goes away and we just have the ambient lighting from the uh, Nishida environment without the uh, hard source from the sun itself. It's just kind of the ambient light from the sky. So there are two main ways that I like to control the hard shadows that are interacting with our shadow catcher ground plane here. One way you can do this is of course just enabling the sun disk in the Nishida world settings and to soften up the shadows to make them not quite as hard, you can just increase the sun size until you get the uh, right kind of shadow quality that you want to match your environment as you can see here we have some pretty uh, hard shadows on our live action shot here if we zoom in you can see the shadow from the car here is fairly hard but it's slightly diffused from the sunset that's in the sky for the live action shot so we might just try to do something similar with the Sun disk probably something like this is pretty good maybe a little bit smaller Sun size something like that and we can also change the Sun intensity to something like something a little bit less maybe 0.7 so now it's not quite as harsh here and our 3d building lighting is matching our live action lighting a little bit better here so that's one way you can do it you can play around with the sun size and the sun intensity inside of the Nishida sky model that's probably the simplest way to do it another way you could do it so that you can have some separate control between the sky model in your world setting and the Sun itself is you can just disable the Sun disk setting here and then you can add a uh, plane here make a new material turn the plane into an emission material make the emission material a little bit warmer like it's the Sun kind of rotate it like it's off in the direction of the Sun here and since our plane is pretty big it's going to create a nice soft shadow as well and then we can increase the strength of it to say maybe 10 we also need to make sure that this is on the foreground layer here or not the foreground but in the just the general scene collection and now we can just increase the intensity of this emission plane we need a 100 and we can create nice soft shadows on our environment here with very specific control over where we place this without changing the entirety of the sky environment in the world settings itself. So we can also increase this. Maybe we'll try 1000 to give an extreme example. As you can see, getting a nice soft shadow here to make the shadows harder, we can of course scale it down and then increase the strength to create a nice hard shadow, but I think that soft shadow was much nicer. And again, we just need to match the shadow direction now to where that car shadow is. 
and uh, now as you can see we have a little bit more control over the specific placement of the sun and the sky environment a little bit separately but that's just one way to do it of course you can also add uh, you know basic uh, lights to your scene as well and they'll still work with that shadow catcher and in lighting your 3d building here just make sure that any lights that you add are on your scene collection layer in your foreground but not in your background because your background is just going to be for your shadow catcher but anyways this video is getting a little bit long so let's go ahead and render out a few frames here I'm going to go ahead and use the Nishida Sun Disk just for this one since this is my first time playing around with it and I'll go ahead and just kind of more specifically place my uh, ground plane here and I'm not really worried about this shadow edge here because I can mask this out in our compositing process so we just want to make sure we have enough shadow to mask out and this is looking pretty good of course you can add all kinds of different environment elements you can edit your ground plane here so that the uh, shadows are more interactive with your live action shot however this is looking pretty good and the tutorial is getting a little bit long already so I'm going to go ahead and get to our export settings and show you guys how I render it out for the compositing process so in our exports from blender I'll generally export three passes I'll export our beauty pass our shadow pass and an ambient occlusion pass so I'll go ahead and go to the layer properties tab here and what we want to do is we want to make sure that we have all the passes that we want here selected so as you can see here we have our combined pass we have a Z pass which I don't think we'll use so I'll go ahead and deselect it also go ahead and export a mist pass as well in case I want to add a little bit of atmospheric fall off in the compositing process um, and I'll also go ahead and scroll down here to ambient occlusion go ahead and select that and uh, that should be pretty good for our render settings I'm also going to go to the sampling tab here I'll render this at maybe uh, try something like 40 samples maybe and then under advanced I'll select our seed stopwatch for some noise variation and then uh, under the output tab I'll go ahead and change the file format to OpenEXR and uh, that's just a good visual effects file export for compositing and I'll also just choose where I want to save the project here go ahead and do live action building tutorial output and then we'll just do this one as our beauty pass so uh, the output here will be our beauty pass composite and uh, this is looking pretty good 24 frames per second we have all of our keyframes here 1920 by 1080p resolution then we'll go ahead and go to the compositing tab here all right so in the compositing tab here what we want to do is we want to export all of our different passes to different file outputs so that we can composite them together more effectively right now as the default inside of blender it's going to take both our background shadow pass and our basic beauty pass and it's just going to overlay them on top of each other in a composite here which will be exported in the standard output here but what we want to do is we want to export the beauty pass the mist pass and the ambient occlusion pass and the shadow pass separately so that we can have a little bit more freedom in that compositing process so of course feel free to just export the composite as is with the shadow pass built in to your uh, live action shot but for a little bit more control I like to export them separately so I'm going to do that here first I'll just take the composite node here where our main file output will be and I'll just export our main uh, beauty pass in the foreground layer and then I'll just take the uh, main beauty pass in the foreground layer and connect it to it and uh, now our beauty pass will go to our main file output here then I'll go ahead and press shift a I'll add a uh, another file output for the mist pass and then I'll select the file output here and we'll create a new folder for it we'll do mist pass and we'll go ahead and create another file output for our ambient occlusion pass create a new folder And finally, we want to export our uh, shadow pass, which is in our background collection layer here. So we'll go ahead and press Shift A again, go to File Output, and we'll export the image in our background shadow pass layer here. Create a new folder. And accept. And now we have our four different file outputs so that we can composite inside of After Effects or back in Blender if you'd like, and uh, have a lot more control in that whole process. And uh, finally, let's just go ahead and do a quick test render, see how it's generally looking with the default composite inside of Blender before we go into After Effects for that final composite. First, I'll go ahead and save the project one more time. Then I'll go to Render and Render Image, and then give Blender some time to render out your test image.
All right guys, so here is our test render here. As you can see, if we zoom in, it's looking pretty nice. It's a little bit too bright, but we can bring that down in the compositing process. The uh, general shadow direction is looking pretty nice and uh, I think it's gonna work pretty well. Um, one thing to note, if you just wanted to do all of your compositing inside of After Effects, what you could do is you could just change your compositing output to the view output here and whatever you are seeing in this viewport here would be your output for your final composite. However, again, like I mentioned before, I'm just going to be compositing this inside of After Effects in that second part of this video. So I'm going to go ahead and keep my composite just as my beauty pass for that building. And then we have all of our different passes to work with as well in their various file outputs. And since our building is a little bit bright here, if I were compositing inside of Blender, all I would do is I would just press Shift A, go to Color, um, maybe add a RGB curves node here and then connect it to our foreground building layer and then just bring it down a little bit and uh, start matching our environment a little bit better. And of course, there are so many different things you can play around with in the compositing process, but the video is already getting pretty long. So I'm going to go ahead and cut it off here until I go through the compositing process in the next video very soon. Of course, to do your final export of all these different passes in animation form, you would just go to render and render animation and Blender will go through all of the different frames in your timeline and export those passes accordingly. Anyways, guys, that's it for this video. I hope it was helpful. As always, feel free to leave any comments if you have any questions or suggestions in the comment section below. I hope this video wasn't confusing in any way. I know it's a lot of different steps going on here and all of the different render passes can get confusing. But if there is any confusion, feel free to drop a comment in the comment section below and I'll get back to you as soon as I can. I'll see you guys next time.